Hi everybody, it's me, the Fed, host of Inside the Eye Live. Before the Sunday mainstream media political pundit talk shows, there is Inside the Eye Live, where we break down some of the weekly mainstream media talking points before the talking points even get aired. Add in some entertaining stories, weather, cats, intriguing and informative guests, and you get one of the most listened to Saturday morning streaming media political talk shows going today. And it's all right here on our flagship station, Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. So join me, The Fetch, for Inside the Eye Live every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock a.m. Eastern. It is truly intelligent media for the politically aware. Welcome to Sacred Matrix, a divine paradigm of love and universal consciousness, with your host, Janet Kira Lesson and Dr. Sasha Lesson. Together we transform the world. And now, here are your hosts, Janet Kira and Dr. Sasha Lesson. We have a very special Anunnaki, A.R. Gordon, Aliens and Us panel with, let's get more cast of characters here, uh, Charlotte Rose, Joshua Kent, Karen, Christine Patrick, C.J., Glenn Bogue, and Michael Lee Hill. So we have quite a panel here, and we're going to be moving this along quite rapidly with uh, three to five minutes. Um, answers to a series of questions, and then uh, this two hours will go very rapidly. Dr. Lesson, are you there? Yes, I'm here. This is a, a really exciting program. As you know, uh, I, I have this uh, website, Enki Speaks, and I thought there's a whole bunch of other people that are emanating Enki energy, and this is the age of Enki, the age of Aquarius, and especially, I saw it in Michael... Uh, uh, Tellinger, but especially do I really feel this energy coming from Michael Lee Hill, who we have with us uh, today. And so uh, we're going to see uh, all about uh, Enki and the age of Aquarius and how uh, A.R. Borden has helped us make the bridge from ancient times to right now. So welcome, everybody. So I'm going to bring you on one at a time. We're going to start with Michael Lee Hill because he's been with us the longest. Well, Glenn Bogg has been with us um, about the same time, if not longer. And these are two Anunnaki researchers. So, Michael, welcome to the show. Our first uh, question is to get a bit of background. Go ahead. Hi. Say hi. Hi. How, how's everybody doing? We're doing great. Uh, this is quite a, an event we have with all these people. So we're going to get some basic information this uh, first one, and we're going to keep doing these panels and do some more individual interviews with all the members. And But since you uh, were our first contact about AR Gordon and that information, and um, we'd like to begin with you. If you could tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, a little bit of background about what is this AR, who is AR board, and what is this Linkage Institute, and how does it connect with the Anunnaki? And I'm going to give you about five minutes to do that, okay? Sure. Go ahead and start. Uh, well, <clears throat> I guess my story started with the Lake Erie UFOs. I uh, started seeing these UFOs out over the lake and started to videotape them and amass quite a library. And uh, that eventually led to face-to-face -face contact with the Anunnaki and um, and all that wrapped up with how I met AR and uh, what had happened was I came across some leaked information on the web um, concerning pretty much manifesting your own 
reality that they call it LERM, light encoded reality matrix. And I tracked down those papers back to the life physics group and just dry uh, emailed them and said, Hey, I'm really interested in this. And uh, next thing I knew, um, you know, AR pretty much said, why, why give you a fish when we can teach you how to fish kind of thing and you'll have fish forever. And, uh, they did some remote viewing kind of stuff and realized that I am, they said Gnostically, they knew I was in contact. And, uh, that is what brought me into the fold. And boy, I've learned so much just not only from AR, but everyone that is on this panel today, I, uh, consider them to be some of the wisest people I've got to know. So I'm excited. Excellent. Um, anything else you want to share? Because you can pass any time. I can go to the next person and we'll try to get around to uh, as many people or, you know, anyway, just keep going round and round and round. What else would you like to say? You have about three more minutes. Ah, uh, you know, uh, as far as my own thing goes, I uh, th that'll do for an intro. I uh, I want to give everyone else as much time as possible because a lot of people that tune into your show, I've I've got a chance to tell my own story, and uh, I really want. I'm really curious to hear everyone else as well. So uh, I think that'll do for an intro. Okay, great. So next we're going to go alphabetically to Charlotte. Charlotte, are you with us? Yes, I'm here, Janet. Hi, same thing. How did you get involved in this research? How did you get to meet AR? And anything else you want to tell our listeners about yourself? You know, oh, okay. Um, well, <laughs> that's going to take a lot more than five minutes, but I'll give you a brief intro. And that is, um, I had some experiences since childhood that led me to the Anunnaki and in particular to Inky. And I... Um, had been doing research that led me to Michael Lee and I became a Facebook friend of his and um, he actually is the one who introduced me to AR. He had sent me a documentation, uh, an interview that AR did and I instantly knew him. I saw his picture and I was like, I know this person. And um, Michael kept saying, you need to, you know, you need to add him. You need to get to know him. And, um, so I sent him a friend's request on Facebook and um, little did I know PJ was his assistant and PJ, who is now my husband, <laughs> is the one who um, answered that email and um, messaged me back and uh, AR was away. He was on business and PJ was filling in for him. And then he said when he told AR who it was, he said, yes, add her. He instantly knew me, and he added me, and at, like Michael said, he noticeably knows the fold. I, I, he just noticeably knows those who are involved in all of this, and he became like a father to me. I called him dad. He told me to call him dad, um, and PJ and I met through the group, and he later became my husband, and... AR has taught me, well, actually, I, I don't want to say taught because I think taught is the wrong word and in, in he just helps us to remember. We already have this knowledge in us. It came with us to this planet. So we already have this knowledge there. The things that we were doing, we were doing since childhood. We didn't know what it was, though. He helped us put a name to it. He helped us understand what was happening to us. Uh, the things that we could do, our abilities. He helped us to understand what they were. And um, I will be forever grateful to him and to this group of people. This panel here is the most amazing people on this planet. They are just heart-centered, wonderful human beings who are out there. They're not, it's not about ego. It's not about money. It's not about materialism. It is about getting this amazing knowledge out there to the world and helping to change each individual on a soul level to ascend, to, to bring forward this amazing time that we're in. Um, I'm just really a grateful person for that. I'm grateful for you, Janet, for 
Dr. Lesson for allowing all of this to happen. We had lost contact with each other. We are now back together as a group, stronger than ever, I believe. And that's all thanks to you guys. Oh, thank you. I think it's, uh, all of us putting the energy out to the world. Uh, is that anything, anything else you want to say? You have another like minute or two. Uh, no, I, I really want to hear from everyone too, like Michael, and I'm going to be doing a one-on-one -on -one with you, so we'll get into my story and details then. And right now, I just want to, I think it's great when we, when we get together, we spark each other. I want to hear from each person, and I think that a, a great way that we can do it is just like a little round table discussion, and each person can just add, you know, add in something, add in something, because that's how it always is when we're together. There's just this amazing, I can feel it right now. I don't know if you guys are feeling it, but there's this amazing energy right now. It's just great. <laughs> so I want to hear from everyone. I want to hear from everyone. So I'm ready to pass and go to the next person. <laughs> okay, thank you. When, oh, was uh, Sean able to bring you into the queue here? Len, are you here? Okay, maybe he'll join us later. So we'll go to the next person. I'm going alphabetically and boy, girl, boy, girl. Okay, Sean's still working on getting Glenn in. I just heard from our producer. Karen, are you there? Yes, I'm there. I have a bit of a hard time hearing you, so I hope you'll call my other line again. But I'm totally excited about this. Totally excited about uh, these people and you guys doing this series. I told a bit of my story in the interviews that I've done with you, so I'll just recap that, that I met. I, I was having experiences um, since childhood, and then they were kind of repressed, and then they came back like Gangbusters 2009. I started doing automatic writing, and, and eventually I'll have my book out of the experiences that happened to that. Uh, but I was reading everything I could on the Anunnaki. I was kind of reluctant because that was my Anunnaki contact kind of freaked me out a little. Um, and I found A.R. Borden, an article he wrote uh, in UFO Digest about um, extraterrestrial contact, and I just loved it. I don't have the exact title exactly, but I ended up contacting him, and then I just sort of eventually met everybody. Michael and Charlotte and I were on a radio show together, and we've kept in touch. And uh, 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 others, we, you know, different projects that AR worked on, we met each other. And uh, to me, it felt like family. It's just like family because really most of us spent a good portion of our life in isolation with our experiences. And this is a beautiful thing happening, not just with this group, but in general, the experiencer movement is on. I, I work with the Dr. Edgar Mitchell Foundation for Research into extraterrestrial encounters, and believe me, I've practiced that. Um, and it's wonderful. Like It's like we've had this kind of expertise thing of ufology and then a little bit more expansive you know, speculation and exopolitics. But I believe the, the, the primary protocol is peer-to-peer, -peer, you know, between us and them. Are, and basically what we're finding in some cases, and in my case, is the ancestry. Is I've been working on discovering the ancestry, our ancestry from the stars. And so uh, I've really appreciated uh, uh, Janet and Sasha, your work on the, the very confusing pantheon of the Anunnaki, where they have multiple names and multiple roles, and it was darn confusing. So thank you for sorting that on your inkyspeaks.com. As I go to it often, I send people to it because it's a way to say who these people were and then the influence they have, and then the confusion is what we've been told happened in our history. And I, I was very blessed by one of my contacts who said there's the history. The, hus the history is what really happened, right? The history is what happened to our ancestors and even our own personal history is important. So it's, it's kind of all we got, right? Our personal human experience. And what happens is the leadership in ufology that may or may not be contactees or abductees or anything tell us what we're supposed to be experiencing. And we're coming to this point where... That's not working for at least me. It's not working for me to be told what my experiences are. And the thing I talked about all day today, it was just like a theme for me today online, was how important the details are. Like, it, you get tempted when you tell the story to kind of make the story more palatable or credible, but the details, you know, the little details, you, if you stick with them and learn about them, it, it's like little breadcrumbs that will lead you to all kinds of cool stuff. 
AR was one who would listen. This is the, you know, let you tell your story the way you are. Knew kind of who we are, <laughs> you know, our ancestry and who we are, at least as branch, right, as a human tree. Um, and now, you know, some of us have developed wonderful friendships of people, you know, going through this same self-discovery. And I'm excited, very excited about meeting with all my good, good family slash friends. Uh, and also with you guys to talk about all this. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Joshua, you're next. Are you there? Yeah, I'm right here. Okay, Joshua, uh, take it away. Tell us about yourself and how you got into this research and all that. Okay. 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 Well, my name is uh, Joshua Kent, and um, like everyone else here, I've, you know, been having experiences all my life, and I've always been interested in spirituality and you know, metaphysics and where science meets all of it. Um, I came to AR Born um, through research initially, and I had found something um, online. It was an email. And <clears throat> I, like Michael, I also pursued that exact same, something just told me to keep, keep digging, keep finding it. And this email was very, very old. I honestly wasn't expecting any sort of response or any sort of anything. You have um, and almost instantly, the day I emailed it, I got an email response back. And <laughs> what was interesting about AR when I first started talking to him is with me, he was very, he, he tested me a lot. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he put me to tasks like, you know, I, I, I'm definitely not a scientist. And um, at the time, you know, I was just beginning school and I didn't really know anything about uh, life physics in the way that I do, uh, the way that I feel that I do now. Um, and he, he made me create like a little experiment, you know, for things like accelerated learning and things like that. And I didn't really know what I was doing, but uh, <laughs> he had a very interesting uh, way of teaching and he always wanted people to, to learn for themselves. Um, and anyway, so uh, over a period of time, you know, more exchanges happen. I communicated with him more through forum and I got to know everybody here on this panel. Um, we all really instantly connected. I always felt instantly connected to him. And uh, a lot of his knowledge and life physics really drew me to it because it was finally a kind of a scientific explanation for a lot of the things that many of us knew and experienced. But like Charlotte said, we didn't have a name for or um, a method to label it. And before that, I'd been kind of just doing it on my own. I'd been talking to all sorts of people. I've, I've, communica I've been communicating with people online and offline. You know, every, it, one of the things I was really interested in, you know, is research in the secret societies and you know, Masonic beliefs and things like that. And um, since then, I, I've, I've come a long way. Um, and I had an experience where I can only describe it as my third eye opening on its own. And, um, I, you know, threw me for a loop because I, there's a lot of things in, the, in these subjects that I didn't even really know about. And then I kind of just had to navigate through it. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's just kind of a general rundown. And, and it, it keeps growing and evolving, you know, and I, I, I love to communicate with people and I, everybody here is like family to me. Um, so I'm very grateful for, thank you for having me here. Oh, you're most welcome. We're glad you're here. Uh, I just got a word that uh, Glenn is, uh, is coming on. Let me see. Um, cool. Sean's calling him now. We keep getting the sound of a phone call, but we always got everybody on, on board here. Okay, so I guess you can call without us hearing it. Let's go on to PJ. PJ, are you with us? Yes, hi. How are you? Oh, we're great. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got involved with the uh, on and off research and AR Borden. Oh, wow. Oh, geez. I don't know where I should start from. Um, well, let me, let me try a little... <laughs> Sure, a little bit. Um, um, it's go back to ever since I was uh, three years old. Um, back then I met um, Ar, and actually um, his uh, his wife back then named Ann. Um, uh, long story short, my my grandpa uh, knew Ar then. Because uh, that's back in when AR was a military uh, lifestyle. Um, my grandpa was too, and they met, and um, they saw me, and we went from there. Um, 
Um, and um, I am um, the when AR we talked about, I knew what he was doing. He told me that I also knew um, what I'm doing in his words, and he uh, I didn't know many terminology he used back then, but then he told me that we have deep and Hello. once we connect and he says go from there. Um even when I met him since when I was a kid, he didn't uh he was very um brief guy and very with with very dry humor. But still funny guy too at the same time and um, I, I thought of this in, as in one of my um, my my uncle-ish grandpa <laughs> or dad. Um, the one thing about he said about the um, besides point of uh, using a terminology of alarm or NTO or ENS, anything like that. That's yeah. It just has not been quite awakened yet to many. Uh, like us out there. They just don't know how to put it and why is it happening or what's going on or what's up there or what's down here. Um, it, I guess in a way we are programmed to be supposed to be confused in many ways, but then mm-hmm. put it out there that it's, not, it's, it's there. It's been there. Um, it's been done. Um, it's always been there. We all have this. Uh, this gift I'm talking about that um, contacts with other entities that are out there. Um, they've always been known um, in our in our mind and our heart. We just know it. Um, in a way, with, you know, people say that we found a soulmate. You know, um, or 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 Air would say, well, "What about them apples?" <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, that was his, his term, and then um, um, by meeting him, and and I know he he put me as his 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 personal assistant, but I was doing lots of um researching with him. Um, not only because not not only just find out things uh through the person the person all through the net through through anywhere, uh, and then we also have. For him and I together, we have a chance to meet, um, oh, I should say, entities. Um, we have some experience with that, too. I was also contacted uh, when I was a little kid, when I was about, I will say, when I was three years old, too, um, out of contact. But back then, I didn't know what they were called or, or, or what were they or who were they exactly back then. I just knew what they looked like. Um, or was that, um, very interesting at that point. And, you know, when you, when you're a little kid, you're like, okay, what's going on? Why am I here? What happened? And then, and then you feel like you just wake up in the morning. What just happened? Kind of type situation. Mm -hmm. Um, there's so much information or, or, or things I can talk about, but it'll, it'll take me an hour and hour and hour and just to talk about it. <laughs> um, the longest short right now is I am really glad and this group, which we have an amazing group of people right now, and then we, we had our ups and downs sometimes, but this is a very good opportunity to, you know, have a, have a kickstart off with. Um, for me, um, that okay, AR and I've been working on our natural, our human natural energy we have that is given by, or she would say we're programmed by from from them, <laughs> also known as the entities and Anunnaki's out there. Um, mm-hmm. That um, it, we'll, we'll talk about that later on when, when more time comes to, but. I think my time is running out at this point, so I'm going to let the others talk also. <laughs> okay, great. We'll be back to you. So, excuse me, that is real call. 
I think we now have Glad and Glad you're you're I hope you're there. You're new to our group here, but you're one of my Anunnaki researchers that I've known for several years now. And I probably missed most of the conversation because it took so long to get you on board. But welcome to this show, Glenn. And the first round, we want you to, uh, you're gonna, you have about four or five minutes, and tell everybody a little bit about yourself and your Anunnaki research and um, whatever you want to share for about five minutes. Glenn, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hi, Janet. Hi. It's great to be on your show again. We're so glad to have you. My my background is my background is as a normal person. <laughs> so anyone listening and thinks the show's a little far out, I was an Olympic athlete. I've been a lawyer. I have a master's degree in uh, modern European history, and I came out the Anunnaki kind of through the back door research when the Catholic Church would do nothing to help my family resist a divorce by my ex-wife. And I began to wonder, right around the time of the pedophile scandal broke in the 90s, um, what else the Catholic Church uh, was up to that they weren't honoring uh, the second plank of the, um, of the Catholic faith, no divorce. And uh, began to wander back toward um, the origins of mankind and, and, and how we got here, etc. And then ran into Sitchin's work. And being uh, somewhat of a biblical scholar, uh, I began to make a strong comparison between Jesus Christ and Enki. And your guest who just spoke was talking about this essence that we have inside the human body uh, that is Avi Anunnaki. <clears throat> and I initially had to use um, uh, reincarnation as my principle, how Enki probably died and then was born in, in Jerusalem. And when, then when I thought about it more, I began to think about Einstein's relativity and say, wait a minute, the Anunnaki live a very long time. So three and a half thousand years of our time is one year for them. And with that, I realized I didn't need uh, incarnation anymore, reincarnation. They, they're still here. From the time of Jesus Christ till now is only 2,000 years. That's just uh, two-thirds a little less than two-thirds of a year. So it's really just August uh, for him. And once I divided the, the four founding Gospels, uh, John and Mark are the originals, and Matthew and Luke are built on Mark, but are built much later, around 300 AD, around the time of the fashion of the Catholic Church, you begin to see that the nativity scene of a baby Jesus, of an of a, of a immaculate conception, um, was created in, in 325 AD at the Council of Nicaea, but doesn't exist in either Mark or John. And particularly when it kept John out by itself, now you have both in Mark and John this wonderful being coming up the River Jordan. He's not born there. They open with the scene of the waters of the Jordan. And he, he of course, has his beloved with him who... who uh, through Da Vinci Co., we now realize was Mary the Magdalene. But I began to put the hat of Enki on top of Jesus and the hat of Ninma on top of Mary the Magdalene. The term Mary the Magdalene is a Greek term, means that she came up the River Jordan to get married. And when I looked at the Sitchin's Sumerian texts, you begin to see this black madonna because madonna uh, the magdalene was known as the black madonna as was isis in egypt and before that ninma was because she had a child out of wedlock with the other rival god that was here or prince and leo and so those two had the child Ninurta out of wedlock and their father king anu forbade them each of them to be married or at least the Magdalene, to ever marry, she would always be uh, the black one, the black Madonna. And so now she's getting married. The great one is getting married. The term Jesus Christos comes out of Greece and means the anointed one. That's not his name. And once you realize his name is Enki and you begin to look at the epithets, the language has changed because of the power of Babel and Enlil, if I'm correct, that the God of Moses is Enlil, and he's really a nasty guy. I mean, Enlil did a lot of nasty things in that desert. 
um, to train the Jews into a fighting force. But when you begin to realize the two of them are, are back at it at this wedding at Cana in Jerusalem and look to their epithets, then you begin to see them as the same person. So both Jesus and Enki share in common the following four things. They both belong to a trinity. In Enki's case, it's himself, Ninma, and the son, Nigashita. In the Catholic Church, of course, it's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit in ancient Hebrew was always, always feminine, which began my check mark that the Trinity was really the Sumerian Godhead, Enki, Ninma, and Ningashita. Second thing is they have in common is the Son of Man. It's a term never, ever explained properly by the Catholic Church. But in Sitchin's work, he says man refers to the Anunnaki. And so this would be King Anu, the Son of Man. At John 3.16, and this is well known to all Christians, that God sent his only begotten son. But the term begotten is an English word taken from the ancient Greek word, the old Greek, which is monogenes. And in monogenes means he's the only one of a specific relationship. He's only one of a, kind of a specific relationship. And when you look at King Anu, he, of course, had concubines, and his first eldest son, his only begotten son, was Enki. And his other son by royal birth with his half um, wife and half sister was, of course, Enlil. So that explains well the only begotten son. And then Jesus says, the father and I are one. And of course, he's talking about himself because Sitchin said that Enki saw the daughters of mankind so beautiful, Genesis 6, 4, that he fornicated with the daughters of man, two of them actually, and put his advanced sperm into Homo sapiens and created Homo sapiens sapiens. And then he said, what I have done, you will do and more. And when I heard that, Jen, as a, as a Christian, I, I said, you know, whoa, you know, what, Jesus walked on water. Well, he means the time we're out right now that we are able to do <laughs> much more. Go ahead. So, Glenn, let's, let's pause right there because um, we've got to go. We'll, we'll come back to that. Make a bookmark for yourself where you left off because that's fascinating. Uh, yep. Sasha, your turn. Uh, and then we're going to go another round. Hopefully, we can get another round in before they uh, talk the hour of commercials. Right, go ahead, Sasha. Okay. Um, I, I just did, my interest in this came uh, from visions I had as a child of Israelis and Egyptians. Uh, throwing tanks and uh, planes in a big pit and covering it with dirt and dancing on it. And this image has led me to the path uh, that can lead us to peace. And that is to, it's all coming down to those of us who have come together for the age of Aquarius. And I'm telling you that just as in the very beginning, Michael said, you know, I'd like to listen to you. Well, that's exactly what the age of Aquarius is about, because Enki is listening to the creativity that we human beings have and what we have to contribute. And now it's the time that we have to really come out and uh, live the age of Aquarius. Okay. Are you done, sweetheart? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, second round, and... Uh, we're going to go back to Michael. So what is the Linking Institute, the Life Physics Group? Why why the Anunnaki? Why are they so important? And anything else you want to add? We're going to go about four minutes this time. Take away, Michael. <laughs> well, that's a tall order for four minutes. <laughs> um, well, we're going to do two more rounds after that, so go for it. <laughs> right on. Well, first of all, the Linkage Institute was – a wish of A.R. Borden's to get this information about our true history, humanity's true history, our hidden history, out to the public in a responsible way. And um, this was in effect to a conference um, that they attended that was not on the surface of the planet. It was an Anunnaki mothership, and it was called The Link. And uh, there was a certain... Uh, representatives from Earth and many other off-world uh, intelligences that 
would meet at this link conference and discuss issues at hand and uh, some possible remedies for some problems that they seen coming uh, a little bit down the road. And um, so what happened was the, the Linkage Institute was an effort to educate people and uh, We'll have to get into what the 3% rule is, but in a nutshell, it's kind of like the 100th monkey, but the 100th monkey puts the threshold at 7%, whereas A.R. Borden's people knew it's only 3%. You know, we've been taught that our own mental energy doesn't have any effect. It's so wrong. It doesn't take many of us resonating at a higher frequency before it spreads throughout the whole mass. So the Linkage Institute was uh, an attempt to bring people up to speed and uh, we can get into this because I think what we're doing now is a great leeway into a relaunch of the uh, the Linkage Institute because I happen to have AR's teaching uh, program and we can get into that in a little bit and I think it's kind of what we're doing right now anyhow uh, you know because the reason I thought that this was a good idea anyhow is first of all I'm really proud of the work this group did back in 2012 and no one knows what we did. Um, and, uh, you know, beyond that, I think it's just, it's time. And I think it's a fantastic way to, uh, keep AR Borden's wishes alive, uh, you know, and to roll this bed of information out with this group of people that he hand selected. And, uh, and then you have your group of all these great, uh, Anunnaki researchers and bring everyone to the table and uh, have some intelligent discussions about it. So that's what the Linkage Institute was. Uh, the reason it was tied in with the Anunnaki is because of the Anunnaki's long intertwining history with mankind going back hundreds of thousands of years. And we're about ready to find out, uh, as I shared with you, I forget the uh, the woman's name that did the show, The Pyramid Code. But using ground penetrating radar, they found out that there's massive structures underneath the, the labyrinth, what's called the labyrinth in Egypt. And uh, this information is going to be going public. I know that she's going to be revealing it at the upcoming Modern Knowledge Conference. And uh, so I think this is right on time for giving an explanation of this intelligence that was in Earth's past first. And I think that that should alleviate a lot of the panic and fear dealing with first contact, because obviously if this intelligence, meaning the Anunnaki, has been on this planet for this long and we're still here talking, if they meant us harm, we wouldn't be talking, you know? So uh, I think that answers the question. Okay. Charlotte, your turn. Yes, as Michael was saying, you know, they have the technology that they have. It is so far advanced. Uh, the fear level is what gets me uh, because fear is another form of control. And they use fear to control us, period. And if they wanted to harm us, we wouldn't be here. Everyone on this planet would be annihilated. They have that capability. But we're all here. They do, they do not want to harm us. Um, when I first realized that we were genetically modified, I, it was hard for me. I, I came from a Catholic upbringing, and I, I was thinking, you know, it's not, it's not saying there's no God or, you know, so a lot of people are worried that Christians are going to get upset, you know, when, when this comes out, and they're not going to uh, be able to accept it. I don't believe that. I believe they will be able to accept it. I think people are very intelligent. I think the dumbing down of society and the dumbing down of America, uh, it, people are just more intelligent by far than the government gives us credit for. And I think that we're able to handle the truth. You know, you can't handle the truth. I think we can handle the truth. Um, and whether or not they want to whether or not they think we can handle it, I don't even. I think it's going to be taken out of their hands in the future. I don't think they're going to. They're not. They're not going to have to worry about it because I think it's just going to. I mean, every one of us here on this panel knows there's something going on. And and with Karen's, I belong to Karen's group, and um, everyone in that group 
knows what's going on and so many millions. I mean, I remember I read a poll and, and as one of our guests here, Glenn was talking about Inky being Jesus Christ. Well, uh, interestingly enough, I read a poll where they were interviewing Americans and they, they, more Americans believe that there has been alien contact than believe in Jesus Christ. So, so there's your answer for whether or not we're ready for this. We're definitely ready to understand who we are and to accept who we are and what the history of our DNA is on this planet. And not just Anunnaki's DNA, but this is um, an interesting, I feel like uh, this was an experiment of sorts our planet. I think that a lot of uh, people here are from different species, different races of beings, and we were all brought together to see, can can this happen? Can we exist? Almost like, and I don't mean this in any kind of negative way of zoo, but in terms of like, there's a lot going on on this planet that we do not know about, and there's a lot of species on this planet that we do not know about as far as DNA and genetics and Karen knows all about that. We've had conversations about that where we've talked about the different beings and entities that, that exist. And um, I, uh, Janet, you and I were talking about some of that too mm-hmm. um, in our conversation. So I, I think the fear, the one, the, 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 I can't express it enough. The one thing we have to let go of the fear because fear is, you know, whether are we going to be here tomorrow and, and the gloom and doom and, you know, that I think all of that thought is so important. What we manifest, what comes from us is so important. The, I think if we can get past the fear and we can get past the uncertainty and understand that they're just, they're like us. And consciously, we're just conscious energy. They're conscious energy too, whether or not they look like us or whether or not they behave like us. They're still very similar to us. We're all conscious energy. So oh, I think, okay, I, I think we're out of time for you. Uh, we'll hold that for the next round. Uh, thank you so much, Charlotte. Uh, Karen, your turn. Yes, I, I'm really enjoying uh, the Michael, Charlotte, Karen order right there <laughs> because as uh, we were together as co-hosts, it was like old times. It was awesome. Um, and, you know, we've, we've talked so much. It's amazing how much we've all accelerated as we talked to each other and reached out and, and researched more, uh, you know, after the, you know, the group was quiet for a while, the AR Gordon contingent was quiet for a while. We've all gone on and continue to learn, and and at least for myself, I feel like I've watched an acceleration of co-learning, you know, all of us who've been contacted or, or just even curious. It's like uh, one of the things I was going to be talking about at one point at a conference and things fell through was uh, what our technology is doing for us, because... Um, What I discovered, and and I want to talk about how different terminologies that I learned from, now let me go back, the life physics group, it probably started approximately the original group about 30 years ago. They did a lot of studies with consciousness studies, and, and they utilized a combination of physics, professors, and people, and assets, in combination with psychics, basically intuitive empaths, and did a lot of different tests, and they discovered a bunch of things, and I have to say, when it comes to when the physics, you know, present their thing, and it's in physics ease, I'm not doing so well with that, but uh, when they talk about the intuitive path, the empath side, I kind of I kind of get that side a little bit better, and I'm, it was, uh, for me, it was a situation where I had my own terminology that I kind of worked out with me and my guides and my big stack of automatic writing, and then... Uh, I had to kind of translate the language that the life physics people were using for the same idea. And one thing that happened that, that came on in the, um, uh, you know, kind of an aha moment for me as a technology dweeb that's been a, you know, I had a, I've been a girl nerd for a long time, watched the Internet grow up, was I tried, it kind of clicked in my head finally that our our social media, internet technology is a replica, like as above, so below, a replica of how actually telepathy and telepathy and contact between between all these species occurs. 
And it occurs, mm-hmm. uh, for, so you have the terminology of like, uh, if you Google something, we've now got that as a verb. That would be vector intention. So that's my question I formulated in my mind, what I want to know. And then I get, you know, uh, uh, an input back. It's like a, like the shape of the vessel or the question that you use. You get sort of the answer back. And that's going into what a lot of people know from the Gnostic tradition in, into the gnosis, into the knowing. And so I learned, you know, I kind of tied these things together about the learning, the knowing, what they were talking about, the, the cumulus that A.R. Borden was talking about, this kind of shared bio kind, bio mind. So this is our, all of our human experiences, as Rupert Shelbrick t- talked about, the morphogenic field, we're learning and we're learning and we're learning uh, as a species, every unit in the species contributing to that body of knowledge. And it's like this wall of pressure. It's going to break through whatever blocks are in front of it because this is a biological imperative. We're going to do this no matter what because this is our next step as a species. And and so basically uh, uh, that's the idea is that uh, we're going to uh, break through this. And a a big message I like to share with people that was told to me is the portals of knowing are opening. Beware to the gatekeepers who won't give way. There's people used to being gatekeepers of all this information, and they simply are going to be swept away by this this need to know for the whole humanity, this biological imperative. So, so this is where I really appreciated everybody in A.R. Barden's material because it it gave me this this impression of really positive impression that we are going to break through. So I'm just very excited again to talk to all of you about that. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, we're using a cough as a signal for time because I don't have a finger that works. Uh, Joshua, we're going to go to you and uh, probably, let's see, uh, 56. Mm-hmm. So, okay, Joshua, real quick, uh, go for you then. TJ, we'll take us to top of the hour. Go ahead, Joshua. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, this is, this is an amazing conversation. I, I'm going to go off right where Karen left off. Um, I I totally agree with that. And and we're all in accordance um, with what's happening in the world and and what's, you know, what's coming and what, what we're, what we're all feeling and where we're all going. Um, One of the things that AR really helped me bring uh, to light for me is exactly what we were just talking about. The reservoir of knowledge um, in the DNA, as well as in the collective, what he likes to call an overfunction, Um, which interestingly enough, according to some of the, intelligences that he spoke to also he called it the christ or the christ um and what it was was the sum total of information clouds or spirit of humanity past future and present and not just humanity but also many biological kinds who have been here there has according to many sources been also a prehistory a pre-anunnaki history um as well as an anunnaki history among um before the deluge that and this is all coming forth today there's there's many different tangents of information that we can explore um but absolutely uh and what really brought me what really helped me personally in, in my work is um a lot of ar's you know books uh they seem very intellectual but they're very they're all based on nocive knowing um ens or extension neurosensing is a process of how one can gain information um, directly. And one of the things that he really tried to drill in my head because I was going through a very intellectual phase in my development was that this knowingness is it's, it's a polysensory experience. It's not, um, you know, we're very accustomed to getting information externally as human beings. That's kind of how we're wired and that's kind of how we're taught. You know, we can go into how that might be deliberate um, and, you know, everything from the education system that creates a kind of, uh, neuronal kind of plasticity in the brain where people are, are accustomed to always getting information out. And uh, we talked about the Gnostics and the knowing and their way of connecting with God was directly internally. Um, and so many of the technologies that AR kind of try to present and bring forth to people was, okay, well, you want to know about extraterrestrials. Why don't you go out there and make contact yourself? And a lot of people think physically, oh, let's go out in the lawn and wait for something to land. But in reality, most advanced intelligences use an uh, internet, as Karen has called it many times, and we've talked about topological thought. And 
is it's possible for anybody to make contact right from where they're sitting right then and there and not just contact but gain information from past future ancestors or anything um and it starts right here and now in the moment <laughs> um and another thing is intention you know we're all talking about the three percent and the collective uh the, hun the hundred monkey thousand monkey effect sorry and that is absolutely true that is definitely going on and you can see it five years ago if you look at how people were interacting with this kind of information five years ago and you look at it now it's it's almost night and day and that honestly in the time you know many of us have gone through our dark periods of research where we looked at you know what's going on in the world and the corruption and all that that is one of the things that has really given me hope is seeing the change in such a short period of time um we can only imagine what's coming um so yeah <laughs> do i still have time or you're, you're one more minute okay one more minute okay so um and another thing that drew me to this is the anunnaki's involvement and um the creation of what we can call mystery schools and there were also other groups uh in my opinion but today on online most of these symbols are associated with evil and satanism um and there are many mystery schools throughout many times in history that have gone in different ways but you know with this well, going back to enki you could say some of the first mystery schools were started by him um and his son whether you want to see it symbolically or not <clears throat> And even the knowledge contained within the New Testament symbolically represents a lot of the mysteries. Um, and these are just universal spiritual truths that were concealed during that period of time for reasons of persecution. But there's still a kind of concealment going on. And it is my opinion that I think everybody deserves to have this knowledge if, if they seek it. And um, I think that's also where a lot of us are at, taking away some of the mysticism and the the labels and the categories and just going into this universal truth that we all share and can access at any point in time. Okay, great. It's uh, PJ. It will take it till the top of the hour where the curse will come in and then we'll come back and we'll do uh, Sasha and then Glenn and then we'll do another round. Okay, PJ, take it away. Okay. Um, Okay, um, let's see. I think um, mostly <laughs> Michael, Kara, and Charlotte, and Joshua pretty much covered the whole basics of the, um, from going back from LGC groups and, and on. Um, yeah, but, but what, what, uh, what AR and I was by, uh, having this group and actually put it out to the world without, any think about any kind of fear from from anybody else and things like that. Um, I think what also AR uh, tried to do back then, he just wanted to put it out there without just just put it out there without any what should I say explanations with hmm without so much of um, con confusions um, to make sure understand, pe make people understand to just as it is and how it is, is what it is, and this is what's been going on. Um, <laughs> and he would say, and then he, he when, when, when I was with him back then, if I may say more about that, um, he, he just wanted to put out there with just, he would say just, Forget them. I'm gonna just put it out there as it is, and this is how it is, and this is how it's been going on. Um, but he he also been very talking to with 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 this amazing group of people to how to put it out there and and on. Um, he, I also what I got from from this group and him. Um, he said, you know, why don't we just go as when we are like I don't know. Two year old, three year olds, that age group of, we just, but we're a kid that we don't need any kind of explanation to understand what's been going on or what's going on. Just take it as it is and go from the top pure heart that we have and just move on. And as as, a, as being a human race, a human group, we, just, we, 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 we have such a, uh, I guess, a slightness of ego that involves, we need just this explanation to understand what's going on. But actually, if you think about it, we don't. We already have this. We all have this information. 
And what he was trying to do using our our bio mod that we have and just boosting or accelerating or have awakened that it's been awakened for a long time. Even though there is a small group out there that already been I should say experimented or been tested upon to a small groups of using a knowledge of um three percent um anyways um we have about one minute before the commercial comes on are you there yes i'm here um i'm i'm okay. i'm sorry i'm have a little my my um I have a little download going in my brain, right? I have a little blank moment right there. Um, sorry, I'm That's sorry. Okay. I'm, 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 <laughs> happens to us all. <laughs> yeah. oh, man. I, I, I got so much to say, but it's it just, hmm, I don't know. Um, it's not that I'm trying to um, hold on or, or oh, hold back or anything. Just, it's, we'll pick this up after the commercial break. Thank you, everybody, for listening, and we'll be back in five minutes. <laughs> Janet, are you there? We're back live on Revolution Radio. Maybe they're still on break. <laughs> Wait, welcome back. Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> Sorry about that. Aloha and welcome back to the Sacred Matrix <laughs> on Revolution Radio at freedomclips.com. And I'm your host, Janet Karen Lesson, having a, a blank moment here. Sorry about that. <laughs> With my co host, Dr. Sasha Lesson, and we're having an incredible panel with uh, Michael Lee Hill, Charlotte Rose, Karen Patrick, Joshua Kent, PJ, Ben Gog, and me and Sasha. And uh, before we go back to our show, I'd like to remind everybody that Revolution Radio is listener supported, so please do go to the donation button on freedomfoot.com and donate what you can, a dollar, five, fifteen, twenty, whatever you can donate is greatly appreciated. And we do thank you very much for your donation. All right, we're going we're gonna to have Sasha come back, and we're going to go to Glenn. This next round, and we're just, we're just going to go until we get, run out of time. We're going to go uh, free flow. Just tell our listeners what you think you want them to hear, what they need to know about your Anunnaki research and the whatever it is, or AR, whatever it is that comes to mind. Uh, experiencers, this is a free flow round, and we're going to start with Sasha, just kind of Pulling it back together, then we're going to go to Glenn. Sasha, are you there? Yeah, okay. So, you know, uh, uh, Anu, uh, again and again, analyzing the behavior of the Galzu, the people from a higher space, have kept interceding, concluded, listen, it's our job as Anunnaki to foster these uh, earthlings that we've left here. And uh, he even, uh, at one point, uh, abdicated, and Nanar became the uh, king of Nibiru. All kinds of intercessions have uh, repeatedly happened at the hands of a higher authority, Galzu, that's saying, knock it off and help these people. And so that's where we're at today. And AR has uh, been uh, a conduit uh, to the species around and about the Earth that are, are into helping really helping. And one of the things that Sitchin didn't uh, really talk about was the contemporaneous um, life forms that were here and continue to be here while the Anunnaki were here. But we know from their statues that some of them uh, were reptilian and that there were different kinds of uh, uh, settlements on the earth at the same time as the Anunnaki. And uh, there's even a story in Penred that uh, the Nibirans, the Anunnaki, bombed the Pleiadians uh, off the planet, so they split. Anyway, um, things are really way more complex, and yet we have been in continuous contact with extraterrestrial races, and we have sort of squatters' rights, and the Anunnaki have been with us, and their leadership is committed to assisting us, Toth, or Ningashida when he left in 311 BCE, 
said, I'm going to be back 2012, uh, December uh, 21st, you know, when we're aligned with the uh, planetary core, the energy is going to be right for a change. We're going to leave the Satya Yuga, the junk times, and we're going to have uh, a time when uh, there's going to be a, a, a time of peace and harmony and a, and sort of a, a mini uh, golden age. And uh, this is it. And uh, we, we are, uh, uh, you know, like Gideon. We're the trumpet for it. That's all I want to say right now. Okay, thanks. Len, your turn. Well, we've been talking about this 3%. The, in, my, in my view, the 97% uh, have to dissolve, and three fifths of the planet are Muslim, uh, Catholic, and Jewish, and that whole mindset that's been drilled in there has to be taken out. Uh, one of the or dissolved. Um, I think it was Charlotte was talking about uh, the fear level on the planet, or the or or, or the um, the uh, the fact that uh, they're not killing us. Well, it was it's in the history of Sitchin that that Ninma went forward and said to Enki. He's going to flood the earth, help mankind. And that's when the pyramids were built with their shelters of uh, safety built underneath uh, the pyramids all over the world. And then from there, uh, an understanding of the most famous names uh, in biblical history are Melchizedek, who appeared to Abraham and gave him a bread and wine covenant. And Melchizedek was known, it was secret knowledge, that Melchizedek was the king of righteousness. So there's that epithet there, the king of righteousness, which I think was Enki appearing to Abraham. He then appears as Solomon, the son of the Pharaoh. And King Solomon brought the one thing into Jerusalem that Enlil didn't want, and that was the woman of the tree, the woman who fashioned the DNA. In Jewish text, she's known as an Asherah. And then he goes from Jerusalem over to Greece when he brings Asherah, and Leo kicks him out of there because he does not want the knowledge that human beings were fashioned of a hybrid nature and given very advanced DNA. So they're kicked out of there by Enlil, but the couple goes to uh, the Peloponnesus in Greece, and they appear there as Jesus, Zeus the father, and Athena, who is the woman of the tree at the Dona, if you know the serious mystery um, by Robert Temple, there's a picture of them in there. And then, of course, they come back once they establish that in Greek knowledge, which is, which is the basis of Western civilization that was overtaken by Rome. And when they come back up that River Jordan, of course, and Leo goes crazy when he finally marries, as when he was Solomon, his son was the Prince of Peace and the son of um, God. And when he was there, he promised in the Song of Solomon, he's going to marry the Black Madonna. And for a thousand years, it's held to pay, but he finally marries her at Cana, at the wedding at Cana, in the Gospel of John. And with that, El, El brands Ninma the Magdalene as the whore, and that uh, genealogy wasn't found for a thousand years until it was under, under um, earth, unearthed by, um, by St. Bernard in 1107, 1115 in Jerusalem. And then we go into the into the Renaissance paintings, which I'll go on my next down if I get one. The secrets of the paintings are revealed that they knew this ancient genealogy. Go ahead, Janet. Okay, you're complete. Uh, Michael. Well, <clears throat> there's two different ways, and I'll get into the other, which is, you know, disseminating this information in a responsible way. But, um... What I'd like to talk about is the religious, uh, especially the uh, Christian viewpoint on this and what is coming forth on who Inky's Nephilim bloodline is, because I think that's that's what we need to get into as far as Anunnaki incarnating. It's going to be through the Nephilim bloodline, because uh, even in Sitchin's work, he said that at the most there was about 600 pure Anunnaki. Like if Inky was here in his native form, he'd be what, like 15, 16 feet tall or whatever. <clears throat> so uh, when they're in, incarnated into like the line of David, uh, they, well, we need to back up here because where this bloodline is originally coming from, and I'm finding this out because uh, not only with my own research, but being taken 
in by the elders of the Native American Indian tribes, they know that what is now known as the Mound Builders uh, is actually the remnants of the Atlanteans. And I think it's really important because this is a big missing piece of the puzzle because everyone's putting the Nephilim into this negative uh, connotation, not here, but I'm talking in the mass mind media, that uh, these are the people that's behind all the world's problems and control and manipulation. When you find out uh, the Atlanteans on the last breakup, because they said actually there's three major uh, earth changes dealing with Atlantis. One was around 50,000 years ago. Those people went to the right of the continent, which was be between North American continent and the European continent. The next breakup was about 28,000 years ago. Again, they went to the right, but the elders stayed behind with the sinking ship, so to speak. The last uh, earth changes in Atlantis, or they call them, Edgar Casey called them the Poseidians, which evidently is inky, you know. Uh, the last breakup 10,500 years ago, they went to the left and they went up into the bottom of the North American continent. They, uh, The first indigenous people that they met were the Mayans, and they taught them uh, the Mayan calendar and pyramid building and whatnot, but uh, darkness was setting in, and when that culture started uh, sacrificing and whatnot, you know, the the Atlanteans went, well, it's time to move on, you know, and they went north until this isn't even really got out there to the public, but they landed at the shores of Lake Erie, and uh, I got proof of this, and that's coming down the pike, but there was a huge uh, mound complex. What I want to share with you is recently there's been some crop circles uh, from 2010 to 2015, and uh, to make a long story short, one was encoded with the name Ia Inky, and uh, another one just appeared that said, beware of ETs bearing false gifts, and you could tell it's the exact same uh, people. What I want to tell you is these crop circles are encoding the most harmonious frequencies, which actually gets into uh, free energy. And um, what I can tell you is... Once you uh, get into what those most harmonious frequencies are, it's just science. Uh, and it's provable now through a scientific uh, technology called cymatics. And um, those, those numbers are encoded into these earth mound complexes as well, not just these um, uh, crop circles. So what I'm finding out through the Native American Indians is uh, they've told me they know it's in for 10,000 years of oral history and 5,000 years of written history. They know the Atlanteans became the mound builders, which intertwined into the Native American tribe of Indians. I'm saying all this because what does that have to do with Freemasons and skull and bones and secret societies and all that? Nothing. You know, these people, one of the lost tribes of Israel, who intertwined into the Native American Indians had genocide committed against them, uh, the worst on this planet ever. So uh, I think it's a big missing piece of this puzzle that needs to be uh, released. And I'm, uh, that's what I feel I, I'm putting a lot of energy into that. Okay, thank you. Charlotte. Yeah, you know, Michael was talking about genocide and think about the Trail of Tears. What was done to the Cherokee people? I'm Cherokee, and my ancestors knew that we came from the stars. They knew it. It was in their oral teachings, their oral history. Um, again, he, uh, Michael, you've done a lot of research into um, the uh, bloodlines through the Native Americans and the different groups that we have here. Uh, I know that the Cherokee are B positive. There's not a lot of Native Americans that are B positive bloods. Um, I've done a lot of research into that as well, just, just through genealogy, because I'm really curious about my ancestors, but no one, you know, we, we know about what happened to why, why the Jewish people are ridiculed everywhere they go. You know, the, what happened in World War II, what happened to the Cherokee, um, there, so, that was something that was very similar. And no one really wants to talk about that because that happened right here. That was, that was at home here in America. And, and also not just to the Cherokee, but 
we know what happened with the Native Americans that were here and the information that was covered up and destroyed. Michael knows more than I do about the mound building that was going on. I lived in Ohio too. And there is, uh, what is that? It's, it's, it's near Cincinnati. Um, Michael. Newark earthworks. Is that? Yeah. 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 I think that's where it is. It's uh, AR was there actually in the seventies. There was, um, there's a tunnels underground there and the actual, the area looks like it's in the shape of a serpent. It's a uh, part, it's um, not too far from Cincinnati, Ohio. Oh, that's a um, serpent mound. Yes, the serpent yeah. mound. You're correct. You're correct. AR yes, was there in the 70s and did a lot of research with that as well. And a lot of that stuff has all been covered up. And I think it's time for all of that to come out. And you're doing a wonderful job, Michael, getting that information out here to the public. Oh, and thanks. I want to thank you myself for that. Um, I just, there's, there's so much to cover. There's so many things to talk about. I think everyone here, um, my husband here, he said he felt like he was babbling. Janet, we were talking about what happens to some of these children who are in there. We call them project children. I mentioned this there. He hated that term because of his involvement. I feel in the, in his military industrial days, um, children who were, there's taken and trained for purposes and that were our military had uh, programs in a lot of places. And, you know, with the uh, contactees, a lot of those children are project children and they've been through a lot and they've been programmed. They've been programmed not to talk about this stuff. So when that breaks and Karen and I had just, I think on the previous show, she talked about when the programming that she had broke and she was able to start seeing things as they really are instead of, you know, the programming we have from our childhood and religion and the truth starts coming through. That's, I think that's what's happening with him. He's able to finally start talking about this stuff. But when you, if he said just this flood of information went into his brain and then it's like he doesn't know how to get it out. How, how to release it. And I told him to start writing because I think that's a great way. Dad, AR, I'm sorry. AR believes you should write it down. Write everything down. Anything you're feeling, write it down. Anything you've been through, any memories that you can remember from your childhood days, write them down. All of that stuff, you might not be able to see where it's connected, but it is connected. The little puzzle pieces that come together. And and it, it, it it's kind of like you, you start seeing the path that you're put on, and you can see where it all connects to every you all everything just makes sense. And I think he's getting to that point in his life now where he's able to start getting that knowledge out. And it's it's a scary place for him because he's been silent. He's been programmed to be silent, be a good you know student, you know never talk about any of this. And so it's difficult for him. And I think it's not just him, but it's difficult for a lot of people. That's why we have all of this stuff concerning um, when, when anybody talks about their experiences, their, uh, the abduction things that are going on, they're, they're ridiculed. They're ridiculed by their neighbors, their relatives, their friends. They, they feel that ridicule. They're told they're crazy. You know, you can't well, we're going to go into those type of things, and uh, we have a, a experiential show that we do in the Korean Radio Network, so we'll, we'll explore even more about Jane Cooper's future. Oh, wonderful. So, um, Karen's turn. Karen, are you with us? Your turn. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. If, if you're going to do experiential stuff in the future, then I'll go to a different topic because I really loved what Michael was saying. And I have to say a funny thing happened to me uh, on my way to studying the moon <laughs> is what I'm going to preface because I, uh, uh, I'm i involved in uh, anomaly research and there's some really exciting developments in that. But um, I was uh, friends with uh, Brett Colin Shepard and the Lunar Anomaly Society, so I learned a lot about our moon missions and a lot of things that kind of went by the wayside in lunar research. And uh, eventually, we're we're now partners, living together in Texarkana, and I've, I've sat there and watched him do his miraculous work with looking at embedded imagery, 
and uh, analysis of the, the the database record of our moon missions and, and whatnot. One of the things he does, which is miraculous, is he's able to see embedded imagery. And what we believe happens is that when the when the moon imagery goes from analog to digital, we believe that there's an extraterrestrial, extra dimensional information, light encoded information that's added in. And Brett was tipped off to this because he was shown his own work from the future back in 1982. So that's a that's a story that's interesting. But what I want to say is that we had a part of this research that blew our minds, and that was that he was able to see basically a legendary figure. So these would be the gods. He was see Zeus and Artemis and the Apollo and all of them in one image. We found dozens of them in one image, and we went, we went through this process where I would be, like, researching who it was in mythology, and he would be looking at the pictures and sketching them out for me so I could see them. And one of the things that struck me, I have a theatrical background in theatrical costuming, is these are not people dressed in togas and, you know, the usual uh, things that you'd expect a Greek god to be dressed in. It, their entire attire was, was different. And miracul miraculously, someone sent me a reference from 100 years ago, Nikolai Dentusiano, who was a Romanian historian, who reconstituted the mythology before it becomes, well, it's a history. He, he, he puts a history back together. Other researchers have done the same. To say that these beings, of course, as we know, as Fitchin talked about in, in the Sumerian record, they were beings, they weren't mythology. They weren't myths, as Joseph Campbell kind of wanted to go with. So basically, as I began to look at how they were dressed and everything, I began to figure out that this was not uh, Greek mythology, but some other history. And eventually, I made my way over into, into you know, looking at his moon pictures. I ended up finding uh, notes about Romania and Albania. And quickly, I'll tell you that the Mon uh, Peter Moon from the Montauk, you know, research wrote a book uh, translating Radu Sinemar's work in the Bishiki Mountains. They found an underground cavern there with cavern there with table of furniture, you know, furniture for, you know, people 9 to 12 feet tall, and they found holograms, active holograms there, and they also found these tunnels that went to other places in the earth in a whole underground complex. So the whole underworld story that we have from mythology is about the underworld, the time when humanity or, or the Anunnaki or certain races lived underground for whatever reason, Ice Age, Cataclysm, the War, whatever, would. So then... Further research got me over into Al the Albania story, and it, and as I'm finding out, DNA proves out, and also linguistic studies are showing that Albanian is actually the oldest root language, Albanian or and Armenian, and then the other ones come after. And I know that might be a shock to people that maybe haven't heard that before. Um, I'm still learning about it, so don't you know? Let, let's all learn together. <laughs> But basically what's important about that is that I, I found a researcher who basically said his name is Stender Fushi, S-K-E-N-D-E-R-H-U-S-H-I dot net is his website. You should look him up. And his, he writes in Italian and Albanian, so uh, you have to kind of work on Google Translate or something. And he is working on one his book, Antique Names in English. And what he said, what I learned from this, was that um, if you take the Albanian Geg tribe language and you combine it with the Kolajian letters, this is a letter that the Vikings used way, way, way back, you know, uh, they find remnants of it. You take that Pelagian alphabet and you take the um, the sounds of the Albanian language, you put it together, and a person from that, um, the knows both of those things, can read the ancient book of Toth, the Atlantean, the Emerald Tablets, which are very famous, and they, they can't destroy them, they're, they're you can blowtorch them, and you can't read the you can't do anything, you can't destroy the words on that page. And so, he, you know, he found out he could read it. So that brings up a whole new uh, uh, idea about language, and uh, there's a, this story, of course, is more complicated. Well, um, what that means is there are, there are records, probably in that labyrinthian uh, labyrinth that Michael was talking about, of uh, Atlantean records that are under the pyramids, that uh, ostensibly have been covered over linguistically and historically in our historic books. And, and, and I'm going to pin the Holy Roman Empire on this. And the reason why is because Carthage and Rome fought, fought each other. And uh, they, Carthage was, was pretty, they, that was a mortal enemy of Rome. And so starting back in Roman times, they uh, wiped, tried to wipe Carthage and the Pelagian Empire off, off, the, off the face of the earth. It was a ritual thing. Taken off by the... Um, Holy Roman Empire and all. So we have a whole hidden history uh, that's going to get more interesting. This information is coming out 
Ten Different Shoes book about antique names in Albania will be coming out uh, in English sometime this year, next year. It's and this is this is coming out whether anybody likes it or not. <laughs> so I just wanted to Great. add that part of the story. Right on. Excellent, Joshua. Oh, hello. Um, okay. Wow. This is an incredible conversation. Um, okay. So yeah, we were talking about a lot of things, everything from a bloodline to ancient history. Um, one of the things that I wanted to talk about is currently in research, you know, the discussion of bloodline is usually one of, you know, royal, uh, descendants or, you know, the quote unquote Illuminati bloodlines and, uh, you know, creating a kind of sphere of control, but there have also been, uh, many bloodlines throughout history. Um, whose purpose was to preserve uh, spiritual knowledge as well. Um, and many of these lineages have also been uh, hunted down and eradicated. And, and they exist in the native cultures as well as in, um, <clears throat> you know, in European cultures, all, all the way back to the Druids, you know, and the, the quote unquote Aryans. Um, and <clears throat> they, they've been, you know, they, in a sense, are even more secretive uh, because of having to survive throughout the time. Um, and there, they might be even, there might even be a connection directly to the Anunnaki. And different bloodlines serve different purposes for different beings and different factions at different times. Um, so <clears throat> I just wanted to bring that out because right now, you know, there's a lot of talk about a controlling group of bloodlines or, you know, they're all on the same team or their symbols are all the same. And Symbols are generally neutral, um, and in terms of most of the symbols that people associate with the Illuminati, they were often uh, they were symbols of initiation for spiritual practices. Um, and the East and the West, while they differed in, in their use of symbols, they they kind of uh, lead back to the same point. Um, so where was I going with this? Oh, um, one of the things that. Uh, AR helped and bring up to speed is that, you know, currently we, we focus a lot of our research on the history we have. Um, and AR, I think, brought information out on what's, what's happening with the Anunnaki today, for example, and what's been going on. Um, and I think that's really important as well, because uh, it creates a different picture. For example, one of the most common themes is that it's Enki versus Enlil, and that's still how it is. Uh, well, according to AR's research, as well as some of his books, the you know the serpent clan could be said to be divided or that um that it's not so cut and dry anymore that there's different allegiances that have changed throughout the time and also in terms of human members uh we don't really know bloodline wise <laughs> you know it's hard to for example like the serpent's always associated with a negative symbol you know uh and even in this esoteric sense there is a lot of deep spiritual principles that are there for example the caduceus symbol of Hermes, Ninghishizida, you know, the, the mystery knowledge. And then there's also the association with uh, suppression and, you know, Satanism and things like that. Um, so I, what I was trying to get to is that it's, it's quite convoluted, um, but at the same time, it's important um, never to make it black and white because there's so much going on and there's so much research and it's all being brought out to light. And I think this is great that we can all talk about all this because we can put all the pieces together and begin to see it from a topological angle where there's many shades of grays and many dynamic changes throughout history as well as right now. Um, so yeah, uh, I think, <laughs> I think that's important. I, do I still have time or? Okay. Are you done? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Joshua. PJ, mm -hmm. your turn. Um, he wants to know if it's okay if he passes on to Sasha right now, because he is still recovering. <laughs> Okay, that's fine. Sasha, your turn. Uh, okay, you know, I think it's really uh, useful to uh, put ourselves, uh, in, realize that in, in this holographic universe, Nimma and uh, Enki and Enlil, all the characters are, uh, and Galdu and the creator of all are, are within us as well. And, and, and to sort of access what is the, uh, in this coming age, what is the nimma, the compassionate, feminine uh, part of you uh, uh, envision? Uh, in this uh, Aquarian age, uh, what does the uh, Toth, the Ningashita part, this creative, uh, how are you going uh, to see that? What's, what's that telling you in, in, in your environment? What's the Enki part? And I think the, uh, you're going to see it's 
a lot less uh, control and a lot more spontaneity. That's it. That's it. Okay, Glenn. Uh, coming quickly through the Middle Ages, we see that the uh, this ancient <laughs> knowledge that I'm piecing together is present in, in three main works of art. The first one is called the Arnolfini Portrait, which was by Van Eyck in about 1440, but it has now been renamed the Double Portrait because it, it is, in fact, the marriage of Enki to the Magdalene and, and two other secrets that are there. It's the most enigmatic painting in all of recorded history. It was photographically perfect. And the one who came closest to that artist, who was Enki, I think, who painted that photograph, was Da Vinci. And Da Vinci is always thought to be the greatest painter, but he's really second behind Enki and took his lead from them. He paints the Madonna of the Rocks, where there's the two male children playing there, Ningushita and, and Enki. And above her head, in the stone, is the male member sticking straight up with two testicles there, of course, the Italian for the rocks. The third artist is uh, Michelangelo, of course, who has the Garden of Eden uh, scene at the top of the Sistine Chapel. He knew the ancient history of, of Enki and Ninma. But from that was crushed by the stealing of the Knights Templar Bank. And in 1717, George I was brought from Germany to shut down the Royal Society that produced Isaac Newton. And they were getting so close to the knowledge. And for now 300 years, it's been all about money. But the U.S. is about to implode. Uh, the banks are going to collapse, and you've got the military equipment in the hands of the sheriff's department coming back from Iraq, and you're going to have a civil war that will make the American Civil War of um, uh, 100 years ago to be a baby cake, kindergarten, compared to what you're going to see in the streets of, um, of the United States in the Civil War. And the one who warned Americans about that was the head of the CIA, William Colby, before he was killed. Back to you. Okay, you're done? Cheers, yeah. okay. cheers. <laughs> Michael. Uh, one thing I'd like to say is that there is, the World Templars haven't went anywhere. And um, I've been contacted recently, and there's already uh, teaching platforms that are live right now, and uh, they're waiting for all this to happen. Why I'm saying this is when the banks... You know, I was told a long time ago when I first made contact, they said, when I seen our economic system about ready to crash, that this is in the time of Clinton, you know, it made no sense to me. They said that when the, our economic system was about ready to implode, uh, that that would be my sign that we were this close to first contact. And I see that the Templars have a, a huge part in this because, first of all, I think enlightened civilizations – don't use economic systems like we do, but I think we're still in the phase that we need uh, stepping stones, you know, and the Templars can provide that. They truly have the wealth that they've kept hidden and safe for all this time, and uh, they can free humanity from the economic peril that we're about uh, ready, as Glenn was saying, but uh, along with this whole thing, I think it does deal with the implementation of what could be looked at as a galactic society. And, you know, when you learn from galactic societies that have went through this phase of evolution and we can learn from them, I think we'll find out that they truly benefit the whole. And systems of our, like our economic system that do, do not uh, benefit the whole, they benefit the, the few oil and banking families, those systems have to go. They're not they're not conductive to the evolution of our species. So I'm, I'm actually excited about it. I think we're in good hands, and I think that there are systems already waiting to be implemented when, you know, we watch their temples fall. That's well, it. We, have about a, we have about a half an hour left, and I, I want to let go of structure, but I want to just caution everybody to not talk over each other to try to be polite and, and um, give each other uh, space. I'm very curious about these times that we're living in. Uh, how many factions of the Anunnaki are there? What are the other characters in this play? What other species are involved? Who's in charge of the planet right now? Uh, there's an incoming ship. Has it arrived? Who's on that? 
if we could get into, um, you know, some current issues like we started to address and just kind of go free flow when you do talk, uh, please say your name because so many people here are hard for our listeners to understand who's going to say what, and we have like um, a little bit less than half an hour. Um, who wants to address the, those uh, issues or talk about whatever you want to talk about? Michael, do you I'll have to Lance? Okay, who's, here? who's speaking? That was Karen. And uh, yeah, okay, just to, very, yeah, just to very quickly, I'll just say that I'm a contactee of multiple different ones, and I'll just throw out who I've been in contact with. With uh, I have an ancestor who is a 12 foot tall Anunnaki ancestor who I've had contact with. I've had contact with an insecticide being on a ship who's the science officer. I've had contact with uh, something that you might call the founders or the the, the Patal. Uh, this is a little bit difficult contact because it's uh, like listening to an echo of a recording of a, <laughs> you know, it's real faint. It's difficult, very high frequency. Um, uh, a few other Native American Cherokee ancestors. Um, and uh, let's see, I'm trying to remember everybody. The, the, oh, a couple of uh, nature spirits, uh, the spirit of Pan um, and uh, the spirit of Gaia. And, uh, you know, so this, th these are all these energies uh, working together. Uh, and, uh, and I know that other people have had contact with reptilians. I believe I have, have had contact with greys. And one being on the moon named Mr. Green, because he's kind of a grayish green being and he wants more humans like us, us up there than the ones that are already up there. So <laughs> that's fun. <clears throat> All right. Who wants to go next? Hi, this is uh this is Joshua. Okay, Joshua, go ahead. Yeah, um I, I've had a couple of different experiences with different beings and I too, my memories are still kind of um you know uh plugged up um in terms of a lot of my past, but a lot of it's starting to make sense. Um I'm hoping more comes through. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I've been doing a lot of research in, in this area of things in regards to, you know, who's running things and what's going on. And, and obviously, the deeper you get, the more complex it gets. And uh, we talked about different beings and different ancestries and different genetics. Um, and it being like an experiment, I find that also interesting um, in the sense that, you know, that the idea as above, so below, <laughs> Earth is kind of like this holographic, you know, Petri dish slash uh, experiment slash drama slash school um, where it's possible that many cosmic conflicts are also manifesting themselves in a different way here on the surface throughout history and even in some ways repeating themselves. And I wondered at some point, this was like maybe five years ago, if some of the consolidation of, if you will, I'm going to use the term karma, karmas, um, here reflect upwards in the heavens as well in the sense where <clears throat> a lot of it, it seems that periodically whether it's every 12,000 years or whatever it's cyclic that these things kind of start re-emerging again and these archetypes and these patterns play out um, and I wonder and I, I believe that if affecting things here also affects things up there it's kind of a resonance in I find I find that uh, <clears throat> tangent very interesting. In regards to the Anunnaki, um, AR uh, had two books that were pretty interesting: The Link and uh, Between the Devil and the Returning Rock. And he discusses um, the Marduk hierarchy, um, and he he likened them to be two different factions of at least major factions. There could be more of uh, Anunnaki: those who are earthbound and those who are returning. Um, and it being a very complex political landscape, um, one in which the brother, Ninghishizida, is more of an ambassador to the incoming, whereas uh, Marduk's more of um, a rebellious leader who, you know, wants this, basically the prize, you know, Earth or whatever. And I can't say for sure that it's one way or the other, um, but it does put some interesting perspectives in regards to you know, the differences in allegiances and bloodlines and secret societies, which in the past in conspiracy research, we all equated and under the same roof. Um, also, how has the Anunnaki mentality towards us changed? You know, we know in our history, there's been, you know, a lot of things that we could consider to be um, mistakes or, you know, <laughs> kind of impulsive, you know, I mean, 
there's a lot of forgiving that we have to do as human beings and um, vice versa, responsibility we have to take in them as well. And I think we're emerging into a time where this can happen. Um, and we have to be mature and responsible in how we do this and start looking at extraterrestrials and not as good or bad, fallen or angelic, um, but rather as having personalities, individual and also collective. Um, races, cultures, factions, and they've evolved over a very long period of time. So their history is a lot longer, um, and there's many different groups, as we as we know. Um, and he would say that as human beings, one of the reasons for the 3%, the Linkage Initiative, and many other things, is to start getting human beings on the ground, especially folk like us who are already aware and interested in these subjects, to become a part of a kind of a nocive voting community. In other words, by becoming aware and interacting, we because one of the issues is a lot of extraterrestrial cultures and councils do not, um, not I'm not going to say intervene, but they, they, they don't really, uh, you know, they kind of keep at a distance because human beings are so uh, divided and um, self-destructive and we haven't yet learned how to function as one society. Um, so even the idea of a world government from a conspiracy theory standpoint is horrible the way it might be, uh, that might, might come about. But eventually, a world government is, is kind of going to be a necessary thing when we start traveling into space. The question is, how do we want to form that government? <laughs> you know, is it going to come from transparency and, and harmony or is it going to come from, you know, one percent over the rest? So there's a lot of choices we have to make and we have to take as human beings an active approach to um, to to reaching the galactic community um, and not expecting it to come to us necessarily. Right. Um, wow, this is Charlotte. Yeah, this is Charlotte. <laughs> okay, I wanted to add. Uh, um, Joshua was talking about Marduk here, and on the incoming, um, from what I was told, the king now of the Anunnaki is Manor, that's in Lil Sun, and um, Inky has sort of made peace. I suppose they're they're still um, as as Joshua brought up earlier the the serpent clan and the ram clan and Enlil and Inky are just titles they're not necessarily their names it's a sort of a title that that was given to them and and then the, we have the serpent clan and and that's also here too I mean they have the serpent clan and the ram clan of course uh, um on the incoming they have their own names but that's what we call them Maybe. yeah <laughs> and um i just feel like as human beings we have to step up and take our place what we were told was you know we have got to uh we're coming at it in a, a time of our evolvement that we are one-on-one -on -one with them you know uh, a lot some of them are not wanting to see this some of them still think of us as their slaves or their, that will never be their equals. And some of us are rejoicing that we are finding our place. Yeah, some of them think of us as food. <laughs> That's not, <laughs> <laughs> not the friendly type. <laughs> but um, I think the most important thing as this is coming into play is that we realize that we have a place in the universe. So we have a voice and we have a right to be here. We're not anyone's slave. We're not anyone's food. We, we have a consciousness that has amazing abilities. Uh, a lot of uh, extraterrestrial entities um, are very interested in humans because of our abilities, our, our conscious abilities that we don't know anything about or we haven't really explored yet. We're just we're right there at the threshold of what we can be. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Um, so, Sasha, you know the, the it's the cycling hierarchy that they lived the Anunnaki lived by, and that any hierarchy that's imposed upon us is stifles women and, uh, and suppresses people, and so that ultimately. We don't have to be like them. We just, uh, uh, we're just, we have actually what a lot of the Anunnaki lack, which is deep uh, empathy. And I, I think that we can uh, uh, demand uh, uh, information 
and our right to not have to be ruled by anybody uh, up from our planet. Karen, we have heard you. You done? Karen, are you still yeah. you want to say something? Yeah, I am. I want to go back to the food comment. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to speak to what exactly are they wanting us as sustenance because this is a very interesting thing that's being discussed uh, is the idea that they really literally eat our energy. And the way it was expressed to me uh, from my contact days is they basically indicated that what we have is some of the beings, like, okay, we're when we're being ourselves, our joyful, happy, high selves, we're drawing from source energy. We're pulling source energy. And of course, children do this way more better than adults do. And then if we're suddenly cast, you know, into a negative space, we have negative energy, anger, hatred, frustration, all that, sadness, fear. Um, what that is, it's just a secondary level of our energy that the, there's certain beings that they don't want the happy, joyful energy. They don't want to have to evolve because that literally pushes us to grow and to evolve when we're in those higher frequencies. What they want is they kind of want secondary food source like a vampire. You know, uh, I eat my steak sandwich and the vampire comes and eats me. So that's it's a vampiric energy uh, where what they're doing is they're feeding off our negative energy vampirically so they don't have to evolve and grow. You know, I, I don't want to grow up. I'm a vampire kid. You know, this is sort of what was given to me. And so they want to keep a lot of us in a negative state of mind to draw that energy and feed off that energy. And, and, and absolutely, when you're down in the dumps, you feel drained. There's a reason. So that's, that's kind of what we're talking about food. As far as actually eating us, there are reports of that, uh, of certain alien species, uh, but I can speak to definitely to the energy one. And so they would rather keep us in a certain, you know, frame of mind and have an ample food source. So if we can bring our vibrations up, we can starve them out and make them grow. Agreed. PJ, did you recover? Do you want to say something? Uh, he's he's did, just you just your tab you want. Huh? Okay. <laughs> this okay, is Joshua. Uh, oh, who's, uh, who's talking? Sorry. Go ahead. I, I just wanted to make a comment about the food thing because I thought that was interesting too. This okay. is Joshua. Sorry. That's okay. Is that okay? Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, um, yeah, that's that's also another avenue of, uh, of I guess, exploration that I went to. And, and part of it had to do with my own experiences because I definitely had, quote, and, you know, we're not going to get into the experiencing and all that, but a quote unquote negative, and I don't even consider them negative anymore, but uh, experiences of, of things that felt like everything from feeding to direct suppression of uh, my energy systems. Um, and I saw the beings too, which was very fascinating. Um, but I do think that it's possible there are fewer than norm, of course, uh, some that literally physically eat. And it might not be necessarily humans. It might just be, you know, that's kind of how we eat a lot of animals. Um, but there's, I do definitely do think there's also beings that are more on the vampiric side of things. And not necessarily, it's true, emotions, um, but also uh, technologically wise. And one of the things uh, that I wanted to, bring to the attention is uh there's a researcher out there named george lobono who talks a lot about uh because he's a remote sensor and he's involved in all this stuff too and he talks a lot about the different intelligences here including the grays and he talks about the burdens and how they from another galaxy run the clock on our planet siphon energy from it and in their you know huge colony back where they're from they're they're getting that um <laughs> Uh, and one last thing about human beings is we're we're very dense in the way we create emotion. Um, our emotional energy is very, very strong. Our sexual energy is very dense, especially the way it is in this world. There's not a lot of tantra and spiritual union of, of sexual energies. You know, um, it's taught to us to be very, you know, there's a lot of people who theorize about all this being kind of a not just a, a, you know, a workforce for mining gold, but also an energetic sort of farm. Um, and I'm not going to get into that because I'm not, you know, that goes into a whole different side of things. Um, but we do have to be very mindful as human beings. I think one thing we should definitely grow as we evolve is be mindful of our thoughts and our energy and how to harness them for to, to better ourselves because our emotional energy are, as our thoughts are the most powerful thing that we manifest in this reality. And everything is driven by thoughts and emotions. And I think 
part of that spiritual training that we can all benefit from is from learning how to harness that for ourselves for the betterment of all. That's it. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, I want to hear from Glenn again. Are you there, Glenn? I certainly am, and uh, I want to mention two different topics. One is I'm glad to hear about Michael Hill saying that the Templars are here with their financial platforms. I'm working here in Canada, and from here there's a huge movement going across um, from the Native Americans' point of view, or the First Nations were called up here, to reclaim their land and reclaim their banks. And uh, I'm part of a Kanaki tribe up here now, which is an Algonquin route in Ontario, and they have a um, status now tax-free uh, in North America. And uh, they're now looking to bring their banking system to about 70 different countries around the world, which will be more of a public bank uh, that Ellen Brown is running uh, of the Public Banking Institute in LA, uh, based on the North Dakota model. So public banking is that the people own the bank, not the not the central bank by London and Rome. That's coming uh, strong from the First Nations and 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 uh, Native Americans. Second thing is uh, the beings are here because the ancient Egyptians said that the female of the human race can produce on the 14th day and on the 28th day a very special substance during heightened sexual arousal it's called an ormus molecule. It is a monoatomic and it can open the stargate, it can raise intelligence, etc. But the message I have for the listeners and the ladies on this panel is that the greatest machine ever designed in the known universe is the human female. And it was done by Ninma in Ethiopia and she put a walloping pack into that female. And that's what the aliens are after. The ability for her to take them into the fifth, sixth, in seventh dimension, because only she can do it. The males, the males of our race and other races can't get there. Uh, Michael, we haven't heard from you for a while. Uh, you got to respond after. Jen, you got to respond after that one. Michael, would you like to say something? Oh, sure. Uh, you know, I find it interesting that. Um, it's only in the Western cultures that uh, the feminine has been suppressed. In the Native American cultures, uh, the feminine, you know, it was the grandmothers that actually have the highest level of authority. You know, it's not the chiefs. A lot of people in the Western culture would think the chief is the highest. It's not. It's the women. And uh, now that I've got to know them and be around them, they have the most loving culture and respect for one another. Uh, and even, you know, from the elders down to the children, and it's such a joy to see. Um, and uh, getting back to what you were saying is about who's in charge now, I can tell you when I met the Anunnaki, and I'm talking not channeling or anything, it was face-to-face -face in 2008. They told me that they had decided amongst themselves that they would allow new blood into the kingship line which that can only mean one person or one person's lineage, and that's Inky because he's the one that was a hybrid himself. Um, and they said that we wouldn't understand that they perceive time differently. kind of gets into that movie Interstellar, that the faster you travel through time, the, you perceive time differently. I mean, the, fa the faster you travel through space, you experience time differently. So think of Nibiru having a different rate of speed through the ether than the earth. When they came here, they pre prematurely aged. And that's why those Anunnaki were called the heroes. And uh, he said that the only way we could understand that is that say we were doing an experiment and trying to raise the awareness or consciousness of a upcoming species. And we had a two week vacation coming up. We went on our vacation and when we came back, our chimpanzees had created religions and governments and banking systems and football and music. They said, you know, to, you know, that's what they told me. And they said to them, even they're like, wow, what the hell has happened? You know, which they said in the, in the bigger scheme of things, something new happening is kind of unheard of, you know? And they said, by all means, they, they told me that mankind has earned the right to be treated as equals. And that, uh, that, we would get to meet them and they would be returning. And I said, when, you know, cause they said that they'd start to prepare mankind. This was in 2008. <clears throat> and, uh, Marduk said, well, obviously before 2012, and he said it like I asked a stupid question, you know, and uh, 
I think that there has been an educational system put in play because, you know, the very next year, Ancient Aliens started in 2009. And uh, <clears throat> even though they have a lot of, I think, problems and, you know, some of the things they're relaying, it's still a great first step of, because now at least people know who the Anunnaki were, you know, whereas mm -hmm. 2008, yeah. there was very little uh, information out there other than Sitchin and, you know, yourself, Sasha, and, you know, some other few, but, you know, now it's, it's much more in the mass consciousness. So uh, I'm looking forward to their return. So, or anybody, there was a meeting that AR went to with extraterrestrials, and I'm wondering if anybody has any information. Are these meetings still going on? There's another uh, fellow, Corey Good, that's saying he's going to meetings. Anybody have any, yeah, yeah, words. Anybody have any information on uh, who's, uh, who's meeting with these extraterrestrials, especially the Anunnaki? Do we have any human representatives? communicate with them to this day, 2015. Well, Masala says it's the, it's the, and he calls them the blue aliens. And he said they, they came in, uh, his informant good, and uh, another person with the city in Gonzalez uh, have been talking to these blue aliens who came in uh, to really help the situation uh, here on Earth. And that's, that's is his whole set of interviews by Michael Sala. Well, I'm talking uh, about where AR left off. Go ahead. Who's speaking? This is Karen. Yeah, I want to make a note that uh, I, I'm watching this story with, with uh, Corey Good and, and uh, Gonzalez, that's the forgotten Appalachian, and also Michael Sala. And um, I have a couple thoughts. One, I think that the Blue Aryan concept is very interesting because we do have um, the the all a lot of depictions of of Thos, the Atlantean or Thoti in in Albanian was that he was a human with a ibis head so that that was a avian human hybrid kind of being um, so that's interesting and also um I'm I'm struggling with the information because I, I get a little frustrated when there's sort of a council somewhere and they're trying to decide our fate. Uh, I, I have difficulty with that because this is our story. This is our human experience. And so I prefer to see what is happening with us. You know, we are very, very interesting. It's like the Truman Show. You remember the movie The Truman Show? Where everybody's watching this one guy. We're kind of the true man show, right? All these beings are really watching us, they even had ancient beings called the Watchers, probably because we're very interesting, because of what Michael just said. And uh, so I think we're, we're, we're kind of this soup of 22 different species that the military would admit to, and we are evolving rapidly because one of the things Dan Winter, the physicist, says is that uh, we have a Mickey slipped into the mix, and it had to do with Enki's mother. Enki's mother was part of this Pichal founder line of beings, uh, the bird tribe, believe it or not. And that seems to be an accelerant into our DNA. And I want to add one more thing about, uh, I'm a grandmother. Hey, I'll take that, the grandmother's rule thing. But what I want to say is that um, what I was told by my tall ancestor is that we have a ticker in our DNA. And here's the thing. Our ancestry that we're given, our patriarchal, well, here's the deal. We always know who the mama is. We don't always know who the daddy is. So over time, we're going to be graduating over to a DNA base and the study of the haplogroups uh, that Michael's talked about, about uh, the Algonquin lines and um, other Native American tribes, is that that DNA ticker in us is going to tell which areas of the world we sort of arrived at. And that even go all the way back to our space ancestry. So we're, we're going to switch over uh, to this DNA thing, and, and every single person has a unique DNA. And I would suspect that that's how they keep track of the, uh, keep track of the product down here on Earth, right? It's our DNA. It's like our barcode. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of interesting things that are going to come out of linguistics, but the DNA side of the box and also how incredible DNA is. And AR talked about this, and this yeah. was discussed about as a storage medium. It's incredible. So... These are ideas I hope we explore further. Okay, we have two yeah. more minutes. Who wants it? 
I just want to just add in there, um, this is Charlotte, what Karen was talking about, and um, I remember one conversation I had with AR where he told me, blood is everything. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> that's okay. all I wanted to add. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Who wants the title in two minutes? We still have two minutes. But this is Glenn, and do, don't forget the um, uh, epigenetics research showing that the DNA is really inert. And uh, somebody else said in the show earlier, it's, what, it's the thoughts that human beings put through their DNA that create the reality around them. And as long as our thoughts stay up there at the highest level, we're capable of doing what Jesus Christos or Anki said, this much you will do it more. Keep those thoughts going through your DNA, and it, it will respond and produce the results that you want. Yes. This is Joshua, and yeah. I completely agree with that. Um, and DNA, you know, one of the things AR talked about is also epigenetics and wave genetics which is the information contained in DNA that's nonlinear. And that goes even further back than what we consider to be the chemical component. And anyways, that every, all of reality is produced through the DNA. That's absolutely true. And uh, yeah, talk about that some more some other time. Fascinating. Yes. Well, I want to sure. go ahead, Josh. Uh, everybody, who's, uh, everybody who's listening, you know, it's like this is we, the Anunnaki. So we are there. They're adapted a genome to this planet, we could be better than them. So we, the Anunnaki, and we who are this uh, same oversoul uh, talking to you from this uh, conference uh, on the air, uh, let's feel our oneness and bring in the age of Aquarius together. With that, that's the end of our show. Thank you very much, all of our panelists. Sasha, Glenn, Michael, Charlotte, Karen, Joshua, and PJ. Thank you very much. Please stay on the line for just a few minutes after we are disconnected from the server. Much love and blessings to everybody. Aloha. Radio at freedomslips.com. We'll be right back after this message. Who owns you? If you're not in control, then someone else is. Join me, Ivy West, for Voices on the Wind, Saturday from 4 to 6 p.m. Eastern in Studio A. I discuss government, health, metaphysics, Suppressed science, universal mysteries, little-known incredible facts, alternative energies, and even more than you can imagine. Won't you join us on Revolution Radio Saturdays from 4 to 6 p.m. Eastern for Voices on the Wind with me, Ivy West. Because if your head's in the sand,